Hi, uh, this is Sato Sekinen. I'm going to uh, introduce the uh, SINLA project. This is a project report, not the uh, technical methodological uh, things. So our goal, our team goal is a machine that can explain decision in language. So it's for accountability, dependency, opportunity, etc. Example is, uh, Chris just left, but this is uh, IBM Watson Japanese. Ex famous example, a uh, famous uh, question that they made a mistake. Uh, they answer to this question, Toronto, but I want to create an explanation like Toronto is the only city which came to my mind. I know it's wrong. It's because it's a city in Canada, not in the US, etc. So in order to create this kind of uh, explanation, we need a lot of knowledge and one of them is knowledge base, structured one knowledge. Uh, if, so this is, this is the knowledge we need to create the correct answer. So this is exactly what uh, we are talking about. Uh, people say, oh, there is a knowledge like that in the Bipedia, Yago, Wikidata, etc. But for example, this is Wikidata, uh, DBpedia, very noisy. Why it's noisy? Uh, because I believe it's uh, design of the knowledge base is, uh, knowledge design is also done by bottom-up manner. Crowds are designing it, so it's messy. So we have to have a top-down design and bottom-up creation of the contents. So how we design the top-down, uh, I have been ex uh, creating the extended name entity, that's a 200 category names uh, ontology. It's, it's not perfect, but it's still uh, better than DBpedia ontology, etc. Okay, so we want to create a knowledge base, cleaner knowledge base, which can be uh, understood by machine. And uh, we want to create this by uh, extend name entity and Wikipedia, but it's so expensive by hand. So we want to do this by together because we are the researcher creating the knowledge base extraction. So this is a project, uh, Shinla. So we will prepare the uh, training and test data just like ABP. And test data is not open to the public. Uh, the participant has no, uh, no information which is a test data. So they have to annotate, they have to create the output to all the uh, data. And then we gather all the outputs and we can run the ensemble learning and we can create a better uh, results with a knowledge base. So this is not just evaluation task, but this is a uh, collaboration uh, to create a knowledge base together. Uh, okay, so the task itself is just like, uh, like this. From the Wikipedia page, we extract the attribute and value. So in 2018, in Japan, in, uh, this is for Japanese task, uh, we created uh, on the person, company, city, airport, chemical compound domain, we extracted the thing. And this is the result of ensemble learning. The best system is uh, on, the, on the left, 43, uh, on average 51% uh, F measure, but improved 11 F measure improvement with uh, eight participants. So this is a great uh, encouraging result. Okay, and we are conducting Shinla uh, 2019, uh, four tasks, three tasks, multilingual, nine languages, not only Japanese, but English and etc. And same five categories and more categories to uh, structure them. Okay, so this, uh, please come to my poster. Thank you. All right, the next presentation is also the best application paper at AKBC. Thank you, Isabel. Make sure it's paused. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Dustin Wright. Uh, thanks everyone for staying so late for the rest of the Spotlight Talks. Today I'm gonna talk about, give a brief overview of our work on disease normalization for biomedical knowledge base construction. So the team I work on is a joint collaboration between UC San Diego and IBM on the UCSD side. We're part of the Center for Microbiome Innovation on IBM. It's the uh, AI Horizons Network, specifically the AI for Healthy Living program. And what we're working on is constructing a knowledge base from the microbiome literature. So the field of the microbiome, which is essentially communities of bacteria that live all over the planet, including inside of you. In fact, most of you are bacteria, so most of what makes humans is bacteria. Um, so 
with this exponential growth in the literature related to the microbiome, it's going to be critical to have consolidated sources of knowledge for things such as disease bacteria associations, which is what the overarching focus of our, is of our project. Uh, the specific aspect of knowledge-based construction that we were focused on in this work is disease entity normalization. So entity normalization, entity linking is essentially the task of having an entity mentioned, which you found in text, and being able to link it back to a structured resource, such as a knowledge, knowledge base or a concept ontology. So for example, we could have the sentence, adherent invasive E. coli is a mucosa-associated bacterium often found in CD. We need to know, is CD referring to, say, celiac disease or Crohn's disease, which are both gastrointestinal diseases, but very, very different in terms of uh, symptoms and, and how they come out. So, so in this work, essentially the three main research questions, research questions we were focused on are as follows. So the first is, can we use a neural-based model for entity normalization, specifically for disease entity normalization? The previous state of the art was mostly based on uh, feature engineering, so we wanted to see how could we achieve at least state-of-the-art results on this task in a neural framework. The second question we were focused on was what linguistic features were important for disease normalization, specifically within a neural framework. And then finally, and this has kind of been a theme throughout the day, is how can we overcome the relative lack of training data within this domain uh, for training a neural model? The model we came up with is, uh, it's essentially two main components that we focus on. It's phrase, a phrase-based model, which focuses on semantic features, and then an entity coherence model, which focuses on uh, ensuring a coherent set of, men of concepts within a document. Um, the highlights of what we found is that leveraging semantic features and coherence is enough for, to achieve state-of-the-art results on this task, given you have the right amount of data augmentation, uh, our model achieves higher quality predictions using a metric which uses the concept ontology than the state-of-the-art baselines, uh, as well as being much more efficient. So I'll leave it at that for now. Please come see our poster and ask questions, and then please come to the best paper talk tomorrow where I'll give the full talk of this, of this work. So thank you. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Tal. I'm gonna be presenting our work on constrained open world probabilistic databases. Um, so Guy talked a bit about uh, tuple independent probabilistic databases this morning, so I'm just gonna kind of run it through it very quickly. Um, but basically the high level idea is you take uh, your normal relational database and for every tuple you have a probability. Um, and now the semantics of it are basically that you wind up with a probability distribution uh, where the items are relational databases um, and they each have probability just corresponding to the products of the tuples that are in them. So it's very simple, all independent random variables. And we're interested in evaluating queries, usually existentially quantified, which you can do sort of all kinds of things here. Um, and he also mentioned this, um, this closed world assumption, which is basically where we say that any, anything that we don't have any information about, any tuples we don't know about, we assume that they have probability zero. And so you wind up with these kind of crazy situations where um, a query that kind of seems reasonable, but maybe I just don't have enough information about, and a query that is logically impossible will have the same zero probability. Um, and the solution, like he talked about, was to use uh, these open world probabilistic databases, which is basically where you say that anything you don't know about, it could have a probability, you know, say less than or equal to some lambda. Um, and now you get the results that you want in terms of those two queries. Um, but so open world probabilistic databases, really what they're representing is kind of a very large um, range of worlds based on what you set those actual probabilities to be on all of the things you don't know about, right? And we know that we're representing all of them, but when we actually compute queries, all we know how to do is we can compute the closed world probability, which is when we set everything to zero, and we can compute the, the fully open world, or we set everything to lambda. Um, but the reality of kind of what we think the world is, is is probably somewhere in between those two, right? We don't actually think that every single person has, you know, say, a high probability of being a scientist. 
Um, because, so these bounds basically are making all of these things possible. And what we'd really like to do is we'd like to constrain to the reasonable possible world. So, you know, say we know that 1% uh, of people are scientists. Maybe we want to incorporate that information. And we tackle that by basically imposing a constraint uh, on the average probability in a table. Um, and we see what kind of algorithmic and theoretical results come out of that. So if you want to hear about them, come check out our poster. Thanks. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I'm Abhishek, and this talk is about the problem of fine-grained entity recognition. So fine-grained entity recognition, or FGER for short, is a problem of recognizing entity mentions belonging to large set of semantic types which span several domains. So here the domain could be biomedical, sports, entertainment, products, organization, and much more. And within each domain there could be various fine types, such as in biomedical domain, it could be disease names, genes names, symptoms, or in products, it could be mobile phones, laptops, camera, etc. So the overall, the problem is how can we recognize entity mentions belonging to these several domains and categorize them into various fine categories. So if we look at the existing work, it could be divided into two steps approach. For entity recognition, we can do first entity extraction. And then we can do typing, like classify entity mentioned into several types. So in the last five to 10 years, there are lots of work for the entity typing problem, where given an entity mention, just classify them into several fine types. So, so some of them are Figer, TypeNet, Google fine types, ultra fine types, and there are much more. So what we observe is that uh, when we try to do entity extraction for these types, we generally observe poor recall. So the poor recall is due to two, two limitations of existing data sets. So one is presence of large false negatives, and the second is in, if, they don't have, if the data set does not have large false negatives, they have incomplete type coverage. So both these leads to the issue of poor recall. So what we try to do is, so in this work, uh, what we are doing is we are significantly boosting recall while maintaining the precision for the type net and FIGAR hierarchies. So we try to boost recall by eliminating false negatives, at the same time maintaining the type coverage of TypeNet and FIGAR. Uh, in, so how do we do it? So please come and visit it at the poster session. So in summary, what we propose is, uh, uh, we propose a framework to automatically construct data sets for fine-grained entity recognition tasks, for, uh, where the type set is derived from knowledge bases. And uh, we, we introduced two new data sets suitable for uh, FIGAR and TypeNet hierarchies, which have significantly reduced false negatives while maintaining the type coverage. Uh, we introduced new evaluation corpus for fine-grained entity recognition tasks with 117 entity types annotated, and which is 2.7 times bigger than the FIGAR gold corpus. All the code and data set related to this work is publicly available. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Aishwarya, and I'm here to present our survey on semantic parsing. Um, this was joint work with Rajoshi Das, uh, and it actually started as part of the NLP course here at UMass one year ago. Uh, we tried to track the field as it's evolved over the last 20 to 30 years. Let's start with uh, an example. Um, sorry, let's start with uh, the definition. 
What is semantic parsing? It's the conversion of a natural language utterance to a formal representation which can be executed on a database so that you can get the answer. Suppose you wanted to ask the question, how many papers were accepted at AKBC? Uh, the parser would give you a formal query, which here is in SQL, and you would uh, execute it on a database, which is here open review, to get the answer, which is 24. Let's look at the key components that, and also see how they've changed over the years. The context is um, the way that you've defined the context has changed a lot over the years. It used to be domain-specific databases, like examples are uh, GeoQuery, where they had information about facts uh, about US geography. That changed to large-scale knowledge bases, like Freebase, where you had information about a lot of different domains. Uh, transition to being able to answer questions on semi-structured tables, such as those taken from Wikipedia. And more recently, we are able to answer questions about um, answer questions that are grounded in vision. The grammar is a central part of the framework. It's what provides the rules which give you the candidate derivations. There was a shift from domain-specific uh, handwritten rules to CCG, where you have uh, where you can jointly operate on syntax and semantics. Uh, the model until recently used to be a log linear model where the f uh, features were from the grammar and uh, the weights were uh, taken from, like, learned from the data. But in 2016, there was a paradigm shift where um, we started using seek to seek models and you could use encoder decoder architectures for doing this instead. But of course, um, that does not guarantee you syntactically and semantically valid parses. So you use the grammar now to provide the inductive bias so that you can um, uh, like decode in a way that adheres to the syntax and semantics, such as using tree-structured RNNs and um, ensuring that your actions uh, adhere to type constraints. The parameters of the model are learned uh, using a variety of different techniques, like maximizing the marginal likelihood or using structured methods or also now using reinforcement learning. Um, the parser is the part which uh, provides the high-scoring uh, derivations under the model's a probability distribution, and the executor basically implements this uh, to get you the answer. Uh, we think that there are a few interesting um, directions that are worth following, and uh, these are some of them. Uh, especially, I especially like the confidence modeling one because I think it's important for the model to know when to say, maybe I'm not sure, and use the human uh, feedback to improve the answer so that the conversation doesn't derail. Uh, I, I know there's a lot of experts here of the field, and I would be really happy if you come see the poster and so that I can also get your thoughts on uh, interesting future directions. Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Um, I'm Priya Pazeshpur from uh, UC Irvine, and I'm going to talk about investigating robustness and interpretability of link prediction using adversarial modification. This is a joint work by me, another PhD student from UCI, Yifan Tian, and my advisor, Samir Singh. So in this work, our, our goal is to uh, alter graph structure in a way that would change model prediction for a specific target triple. So for example, as we see in the pictures, the model can uh, correctly predict the offspring information for Princess Henrietta. So the question is how to change graph structure to deceive the model to choose wrong entity as the offspring. We consider two kinds of changes in this work. Uh, the first one is by removing an existing link uh, from the graph surrounding P Princess Henrietta, like the uh, offspring information for the husband. And the second type of modification that we consider is by adding a totally fake fact in the surrounding of Princess Henrietta. So now the question is how to find these uh, modifications. And we solve this uh, problem uh, by uh, defining this optimization uh, problem. So the, the, the goal here is to find the modification that would maximize the change in the predicted score after the modification. And this S prime R prime is uh, the uh, search space that we consider for our modifications. And so we just go and score after retraining. So 
for solving this problem, we face uh, two challenges. The first one is basically this searcher space is too big. And uh, to solve this issue, we introduce an inverter function, which going to uh, map our modifications into the continuous space, and we will then use some kind of uh, gradient descent uh, algorithm to solve the problem over there. And the second uh, challenge that we faced was actually the retraining uh, of uh, these knowledge-based completions uh, are very expensive. And to solve that, we try to find uh, an approximation for the change in the score using a Taylor ap approximation on the gradient of the loss. And finding our uh, uh, model, uh, we uh, evaluate our model uh, firstly by finding the sens how sensitive are the current link prediction method. We consider uh, D smart and Convy. Uh, actually, Convy was a state of the art at that point. And we attack Yago and WordNet uh, knowledge graph. As we can see, after conducting that up, uh, both of the performance uh, dropped. And further, we can see the WordNet is more sensitive comparing to Yago, and the uh, Convy model is more robust comparing to D small model. We then try to uh, study interpretability of the uh, link prediction method. Uh, through a simple rule extraction test, we try to extract the uh, horn rules that has our, uh, the output of our models and were the most frequent in the neighborhood of target triple. We see some of our uh, extracted rules, uh, which were common in Dismalt and Convy, the one that Dismalt uh, extract and the one that Convy extract. The red ones is actually uh, the output of our model, and the head of the rules, the right ones, are the target triples. And there is interesting things, actually. The D small paper try to uh, use some rule extractor extraction using their embeddings, and the rules that we extract was very similar to what they had. And by that, I'm going to uh, finish my talk. Uh, we have lots of other interesting results, so please come to our posters. Thank you. everyone. <clears throat> I'm, I'm Ari, and uh, I'm going to be talking about integrating user feedback uh, during knowledge-based construction. And so the central question of our work is, how should we appropriately handle user feedback that entails identity uncertainty? And to get into this question, I'm going to just touch on some background. So in knowledge-based construction, we often start with a set of mentions of, of entities. And one of the first tasks is to solve entity resolution, which is essentially to partition the mentions, um, hopefully by ground truth entity. Now, unfortunately, entity resolution is imperfect, and so we often end up with mistakes. Um, for example, here, where all the mentions are clustered into one, one inferred entity. Now, entity resolution errors often lead to mistakes, like uh, missing and spurious entities in a knowledge base, um, but also missing and spurious attributes of entities and relationships among entities. Now, as the primary consumers of knowledge bases, uh, human users are uniquely positioned to identify these errors. So looking at the previous mentions that were just on the screen, a user might recognize that Rajarshi Das, who uh, all the mentions are of, um, doesn't have any mention of his homepage. And so the user may include, uh, may provide some feedback with that homepage. Now the issue comes up when new data is, is uh, integrated into the knowledge base or new feedback arrives. And uh, appropriately, the knowledge base decides to repartition the mentions to essentially correct the entity resolution mistake. So here, now the mentions have been uh, correctly partitioned, but the question becomes, to which of these inferred entities does that uh, first piece of feedback about the, about the web page uh, correspond? So our uh, primary solution here um, relies on the representation of feedback as mentions in the knowledge base. Um, and what this allows us to do is use the same model that uh, reasons about the repartitioning of the mentions to accurately place or appropriately place uh, user feedback during ER. So in this work, we propose an online hierarchical uh, algorithm for entity resolution, where, as I said before, the user feedback here is represented as mentions, so it's actually sitting as, as a leaf in the tree. 
In particular, our specific representation that we propose in this work of uh, user feedback is divided into um, two parts, each containing different attributes. Uh, the first set of attributes are primarily used for routing through our hier hierarchical structure, and the second set of attributes uh, are used to supply missing, missing information, but also they may include attributes that could otherwise interfere with, uh, with the routing through the hierarchy. So we perform some experiments with various representations of user feedback and find that uh, the split representation here leads to the most efficient recovery of the ground truth entities and entity resolution. Um, and uh, with that, I'd like to, thanks, like to thank you for your uh, attention and I invite you to read our paper number 51 or visit our poster. Thanks. Hello everyone, I'm Archit Jain and I'm going to talk about uh, how probabilistic rule learning can solve or help in solving uh, knowledge-based completion. So this is joint work between KU Leuven and UCLA. So the primary takeaway of my talk is going to be that probabilistic rule learning has become much more scalable and faster than before. Um, so to give you a sense of motivation, uh, you can uh, treat knowledge-based completion analogously with a large road network, so uh, so consider a knowledge base as a large road network which has potholes where each pothole can be considered as a piece of unknown information. But as the road network increases, potholes also are likely to increase and the flow of information is thus restricted uh, because of these uh, potholes. And so knowledge base completion deals with uh, filling up these potholes in a way. So we present you safe learner. Uh, it's a safe rule probabilistic uh, learner. Um, and this is just a brief example of it. Uh, so we start off with uh, a deterministic state of the art rule learner called Amy plus here. So you can read uh, a rule like this, like uh, two co-authors, uh, two entities A and B are co-authors when um, author A writes a paper C and author B writes the same paper C. So based upon these deterministic rules, we convert them into a database query of the form this. And then uh, we use a smart technique called lifted inference uh, to, to get all the good estimates of the probabilities of these rules. So lifted inference is a fast technique to uh, sort of uh, con decompose a large query into multiple independent subqueries, and this makes query evaluation uh, in polynomial time, as he just mentioned in in the morning lecture. And uh, so, with lifted inf uh, with uh, lifted inference, we have the capability to get each uh, query probability as a function of. Uh, the probabilities of the individual rules. So what I mean by this is that uh, if this is my uh, query, I can get the probability of this query for uh, as a function of pH1, pH2, and pH3. This is because I am able to decompose the query into a SQL execution tasks. And then we also uh, cache the probabilistic expressions corresponding to different queries, which also gives us speed up. So. Yeah, uh, it does really make an impact in this because it uh, uh, it's significantly faster than Profile, which is the state of the art probabilistic rule learner. And since it's it uses Amy Plus, so it also scales as good as that. So the orange line is our safe learner, and it has decent, uh, significantly less runtime than Profile Plus. And so the takeaway is that safe learner can quickly fill some of the portals. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, this was the end of this session. Um, thank you to all of you who stayed until the very end. Um, Andrew will now say a few words about the poster session. All right, first of all, <clears throat> why don't you all stand up and then introduce yourself to somebody who's in your neighborhood who you don't already know, and then sit back down again. <laughs> <clears throat> Mm -hmm. 
All right. Good. I'm glad that you're having so much fun meeting a new person. Yeah. Let's do more of that in just a minute. Why don't you now sit back down again? I'm going to have just some important uh, logistical information to give you, and then we'll move on. <laughs> yeah. All right, I'm glad that you enjoyed that and found that engaging. We're, we're going to do a lot more of that tonight as well as tomorrow. Um, uh, but now I have some important logistical information to give you. Okay, so I'm going to let me tell you some things in reverse order of time. Um, <clears throat> tomorrow afternoon, um, let's see. So I find that uh, for really getting, uh, you know, like uh, creative insights and good brainstorming, there is nothing better, except with the possible exception of taking a long shower, uh, um, to going on a good walk. Uh, um, and uh, what's even better about a walk is that uh, you, you often can go for a walk uh, with other people. At least that happens more often with walking than it does with showering. Um, and uh, um, you know, so like you know, these sessions and presentations are, are fantastic, and we've really learned so much. But I think another really great benefit of a gathering like this are the times outside of the presentations when we have a chance to talk with each other in, in, in small and large groups. And so uh, you know, the main event for tomorrow afternoon is uh, is getting to, to walk and talk with each other. And this was a key feature of the first AKBC in Grenoble, so we're hoping to uh, to do this again. So a few important logistics about that. <coughs> um, uh, so, no, it look, the forecast is not for rain. That should be fine, but you know, the temperature will be in roughly the mid to uh, high 60s. It is forecast to be a bit windy, and so you should bring a light jacket, maybe something to protect against the wind, maybe a hat against the sun and against the cold as well, and some comfortable walking shoes. We'll be walking on mostly a non-traffic paved road, but it's dirt for a while as well. Um, it's about an hour walk up to, the, to a, um, a hilltop with a beautiful view of the Connecticut River Valley and the Berkshire Mountains in the distance. We'll like, spend some time up there and then walk back down again. Um, there'll be buses that will take us from here uh, um, to there. And then after that, the buses will take us um, straight from the trail uh, um, uh, to the showers. No, sorry, like no showers. We're going to go straight to dinner at a really nice place. And maybe I asked them whether they would provide like you know warm, wet towels to wash our faces before dinner. I don't know if they have managed that or not. Uh, um, where we'll have a great banquet dinner for uh, you know more conversation and fellowship as well as an invited, invited talk by Fernando Pereira, um, who when I told him it would be a dinner time talk said okay now I'll even turn up several more notches the the, the controversial uh, uh, you know aspects of what else what, of what he will say. Um, uh, all right, let's see, is there anything else I have to say about that? I don't think so. Okay, working uh, backwards from that. Tomorrow morning, uh, um, our uh, session here will get started a half hour earlier than today at 8.30, not 9 o'clock, uh, 8.30, when we'll have an invited talk by Sebastian Riedel, uh, um, one of my um, uh, you know, favorite researchers who's now on the faculty at University College London and also leading uh, um, Facebook research um, uh, in London, who's been, um, a, you know, for a long time involved in AKBC and a, and a great researcher in this area. Also followed by invited talks in the morning by Claudia Wagner talking about fairness and Lisa Gatour talking about statistics and semantics, uh, um, you know, scalably integrated, as well as the best paper award session, as well as a talk by Jan T. Chen. Um, all right, okay, working further backwards. Uh, tonight. Um, uh, so when we leave here, they're going to lock the building and you, you will not be able to get back in again. So please remember to bring everything that you have with you. I know a number of you I know have suitcases here. It'll be really sad if you're trying to sleep without your suitcases. Uh, um, and, uh, um, and you know, the doors will be open again uh, um, tomorrow morning. So now um, we are uh, um, walking over to the place where we'll have both uh, the poster session, uh, as well as a light, um, a light dinner. Um, and that is in the same building as where we had lunch. It's just on the 11th floor instead of like, the negative first floor. Uh, um, and um, let's see here. Is there anything else that I need to say about that? Uh, I'm looking for Pam or anything. I don't think so. Um, uh, if... Um, um, yes, yeah, so I hope you enjoy those conversations and you enjoy the posters. Um, uh, we'll, I guess we'll be, um, if you have input about what you think, the, which poster should win the best poster award, then uh, please come and tell uh, Isabel and Sebastian, sorry, and, uh, and Samir. Um, and I think that's it. Anybody remember if there's something else I'm supposed to tell you? Uh, I don't think so. 
All right, thank you again for coming. Enjoy the evening. Um, I'll, I'll see you at the poster session. <laughs>